Hello, Brian here. I'm very pleased to be able to join you today in the Cambridge Photography Week. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about street photography and give you a number of tips that will hopefully help elevate your street photography to a new level. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a Fujifilm X photographer, in other words, an ambassador, and I'm a full-time professional street photographer. Every year, though I guess maybe not this one, I run 60 to 70 street photography workshops across the UK and Europe. I've written two best-selling street photography books. So street photography is pretty much my life. So in this short film, we're going to look at what I shoot, why I shoot it, how I shoot it, and what gear I used to shoot it with. Now I meet, meet a lot of people who are maybe new to street photography or who have been doing it for a while but are a bit disappointed with the results they're getting and that's not uncommon. It could be because their approach isn't quite right or because the nerves take over and a lack of confidence holds them back or very commonly they're overthinking it and expecting too much. And if any of this sounds familiar stay tuned as I'm going to give you my 10 hot tips on how to elevate your street photography. But first of all, if, if we're going to talk about street photography, we need to decide what street photography is, and arguably, more importantly, what it's not. Let's not make this the elephant in the room. Let's get it out there, on the table, and we'll start with what street photography is not. And of course, this is my own personal view, and... Uh, I'm sure people will disagree with me. Now we've all seen random pictures of a random guy in a random street doing nothing in particular. It's someone walking past that yellow wall, it's a guy in a zebra crossing, it's somebody's granny coming out of Tesco's with a shopping bag. Why? Are these pictures interesting to look at? Are they beautiful? Do they tell a story? Do they make you smile? The chances are probably none of those things because they're just boring pictures of people in the streets. And I'm sorry if this is controversial, but there is a brick wall we all hit and it, it often, we hit it when, when we're shooting random pictures of people in the streets, okay? And this video, hopefully, the tips I, I'm gonna give you will get you beyond that. So just because a, a picture is shot on a street, it doesn't necessarily make it street photography. It runs much deeper than that. And we need to make a distinction here. So to make things easier, let's explore two different approaches to street photography. And these are not the only approaches by a country mile, but they do give us a solid baseline and a foundation for us to build some skills on. So here's approach number one and it's based on the classical or pure definition of street photography. We can trace this definition back to where street photography be began and where it grew up, from the Henri Cartier-Bresson era, through the likes of Elliot Erwitt, Gary Winogrand, Joel Marowitz, William Klein, Jeff Mermelstein, Mark Cohen, and many, many others. It really started in the the 1950s and ran strongly through the 60s and 70s into the 80s and in fact to the present day. And I'm just going to show you some images now that that just reflect this, the, the kind of golden era of, of street photography. See what you think. So what I'm leading to here is a generally accepted definition of street photography. And it is photography conducted for art or inquiry that features unmediated chance encounters and random incidents within public places. Now that's a bit wordy, isn't it? But it's one, what some people are now referring to as candid public photography. 
And I rather like that. I think that's a neat way to sum it up. So there's usually a moment of some sort in these pictures. A crucial word there, moment. There's possibly something witty, playful, emotional, evocative, ironic, sad, interesting, whimsical. There is something that elevates it you, that elevates it to a different level. The pictures were all shot without the subject's knowledge or consent, so they were completely candid. Maybe they have a touch of the extraordinary in the ordinary, or uh, beauty in the mundane, or the unusual in the usual. I love these kind of phrases because for me they sum up street photography. So this is the first of our two approaches to street photography, and let's call it an approach based on the moment. Personally, this is my preferred style of street photography, and it's what motivates me to get up in the morning and get out there, there shooting. It's still very current, and I think it's a style that will always stand the test of time. But there is an alternative approach, and let's look at that. It's massively popular at the moment, and uh, let's say in, in more recent years a more artistic style has emerged, which I guess traces its roots back to the great Saul Leiter. And whereas street photographers who went before him were focused on the moment, or when I say went before him, were famous before him, because he didn't really come to prominence till the, the 80s and 90s, although he shot a lot of work in the 50s and 60s, Leiter based a lot of his work much more on the visual appeal or look the look of the image. The sort of thing that you might like to see on your dining room wall. It has a sort of immediate impact, an element of beauty maybe. There's often not a moment. The story, the, the picture may not tell a story, but it's still a valid approach to street photography. Here's an interesting quote from Saul Leiter, which I think sums up his thinking. A window covered with raindrops interests me more than a photograph of a famous person. The sort of image that falls into this category could be based around strong form or shape, or a particularly strident colour palette, or maybe it's based on abstraction, or more topically and fashion fashionably based on the use of light. This use of light where maybe you have a person walking through a streak of strong sunlight does maybe have some visual punch but it's not really the image that you could really absorb or linger over, and it lacks the enduring appeal of, of the more classical approach. But hey, maybe Leiter's work proves me wrong here. Uh, the guy was an absolute legend. So let's call this approach the aesthetic approach. It's become really popular. You'll see many, many thousands of stunning images on the web and on Instagram. And I know this approach won't appeal to everyone, and I know that some people, a lot of purists, are quick to dismiss it. But art is surely about producing something that you like and something of beauty and interest. And I think Leiter's work ticks that box for sure. But I, I really don't think we should be thinking in terms of what's right or wrong here. We should be celebrating the differences and you should do what works for you. So think about these two approaches the moment and the aesthetic. And we'll come back to these again when we're looking through some images shortly. So before we get into my killer tips for street photography, why Fujifilm? A lot of people ask me this. Well, I first got my hands on a Fujifilm X-Series camera when I was a photojournalist and I was working on an assignment in the House of Lords. I remember the day clearly. I met a press photographer standing next to me who had a little X10 round her neck and we got talking about it. And I guess this must have been seven or eight years ago, something like that. I'd never seen one of these before and I guess I was a bit intrigued. And I got my hands on it. From that point on, I was hooked and I went out and bought one the next day. And that chance encounter led me into the Fujifilm ecosystem. My next camera was the X-Pro1 and in fact, I bought three of these and they became my go-to camera system for documentary photography. So fast forward to today, and I'm using basically the same kit, although now in the form of the, the X-Pro3, uh, this lovely camera here, but we'll, we'll talk more a little more about that later. So let's get straight into the 10 tips now. And my first tip is know what you want to be. 
In other words, think about developing a style. Let me explain. Street photography can mean many things to different people. If you walk out of your front door just hoping for some interesting encounters on the streets, you will probably go home disappointed. So you need to go out there with a sense of purpose. You need to know what you're looking for, what floats your boat. Otherwise, you will just end up with that random guy in a random street doing nothing much at all. And we can all do better than that. So think about what turns you on about street photography. Is it the thrill of the moment? In which case, we'd probably call you a hunter. Or do you prefer a more considered approach, uh, a quieter, more laid back approach? Maybe finding a great background and then waiting until all the right elements come into place. Maybe you need somebody with a dog to make your scene complete just to add that element that, make, that makes it work. And if you prefer this approach, we would say you're more of a fisher. And once you know your type, whether you're a hunter or a fisher, you're starting to hit the streets with a little more purpose. My second tip is all about gear. And my mantra is keep it simple. I will typically use one of two cameras for street photography, the lovely newish uh, Fujifilm X100V, which is just about pretty much perfect when it comes to a street photography camera. But I have to confess, when I'm looking at my shelf over there for what cameras to, what's, what camera am I gonna take out with me today to do my street photography? And it's a pretty full shelf, I've gotta say. My eyes usually get drawn to this camera, the X-Pro3. And this feels just so organic. All the controls are here on the top plate. Everything I need is there. I don't need to delve into menus to change stuff. Then we have the rear LCD screen, which is hidden. Uh, you can't see the picture unless you flip the screen down. And the great thing about this is it removes the temptation to, do, to, to look at your pictures, to do this awful chimping, which is so distracting and it takes your eye away from the moment. It removes you from what's going on in the streets. And the, 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 the facility not to have this temptation to look at your picture all the time, it's liberating and I love it. And for someone who, who was brought up with 35 mil film cameras, this rangefinder form factor and styling just feels so natural for me. It feels great in the hand. So another part of my, my keep it simple philosophy is to leave all your other gear at home. You won't need lots of lenses, a flash or a tripod, a big backpack. I tend to go out with one camera, one lens and a very small shoulder bag. And I, the reason is I'd much prefer to look like a tourist than a photographer. I don't want, if you're recognised as a photographer, people run a mile, people turn away from you. Uh, occasionally people give you a hard time. So don't be that person who goes out there draped with two DSLRs with enormous lenses and a big backpack and a belt with pouches hanging off it. People will avoid you. And that's not what you want as a street photographer. You've got to blend in. You've got to look like everybody else on the streets. Tourists are harmless. Be the tourist. So leading on from this, tip number three is learn to read the streets. To be a good street photographer, you need to be streetwise. You need to understand what's going on around you and to make sense of it all. You really need to be part of the street life maybe matching your movement to the rhythm of the street to the point where you just blend in and it all feels so natural. And as street photographers, we need to see, we really need to really see what's going on around us. So we need to develop a great sense of observation and a real sense for detail. But when I talk about being streetwise and reading the streets, what else do I mean? There are other things. Firstly, we need to stay alert. You never know what's around the next corner. You've got to have your camera switched on, in your hand, set up, lens cap off and ready to go. It's no good in your bag or over your shoulder, which is one of the reasons I always use a little wrist strap like this. So the camera is here in my hand, ready to go. It's manoeuvrable. 
then never hesitate. Uh, hesitation is the killer of so many good shots. When you see that picture that you want to record, get it there and then, nail it. That first instinctive shot is probably gonna be your best shot. So as soon as you have that thought to take a picture, take it. Then think about, how can I do it better? What else can I do? What if I stand over there? What if I try a lower viewpoint? What if I move around the back? Then work out all the angles. We call this working the scene but get that instinctive picture first, don't hesitate. So then you need to also, when thinking about reading the streets, you've, you've got to read the light. You've got to be a light hunter. You've got to know where there is where you, light that you can use, good usable light, interesting light, great light. You've got to be able to recognize it and then be able to use it. You've got to be a, a student of body language so that you can predict what's gonna happen next. You've got to be obsessive about detail. Uh, detail is everywhere and it's so important to street photographers you, for creating visual metaphors like this, uh, by the way, uh, which is a fork in the road. You can go fishing. and I mentioned the fishing technique earlier, being a fisherman. This is where we find our ideal background and wait for as long as it takes for the right subject to present itself to make the frame complete. It's a popular approach in street photography, although I've got to say, I don't really have a great deal of patience. And for this image, I think I probably waited two or three minutes and I got lucky. And that's another thing that about street photography, we get lucky. And finally, on being streetwise, slow down, walk slowly. If you walk slowly, people don't notice you and you tend to blend in more. But by walking really slowly, your senses tune up. You see more of what's going on around you. You hear more, you smell things, and you just take in a lot more. And also have a 360 degree view of the world. Always be turning round to the sides and behind, being super aware of what's going on around you. So be streetwise. Now this brings me neatly onto my fourth tip, which is kind of related. And it's all about making connections. Try to find things in your frame which connect to each other. It could be any combination of people, things, foreground, background, and so on. But you should really be aiming to connect them to produce something interesting. In this shot, the simple juxtaposition provides the connection. In this one, we're making a connection between the sign and the poor old pigeon. And in this one, which is no, in no way a statement about what I think about the police, it's just a, a nice sort of visual pun. Uh, it's connecting a, a word with the things going on around it. So make connections. This will bring real power and interest into your images. And the connections are there. They are all around us. We need to be able to recognize them to be good street photographers. So my fifth tip, and this may sound really obvious, but stop shooting boring stuff. How often do you see a really boring image and think to yourself, how is that street photography? It's a guy sitting on a bench or somebody just sitting in a cafe. Here are a couple of images of mine I shot to, to make the point uh, about what is a, a boring image. And the first one is, okay, there might be nice, decent light, the colours pop, but it's a woman walking past a blue wall. On what level is that interesting? And here's the, the picture I showed you earlier, uh, which I took for this very reason. Somebody running through a streak of sunlight. And we see lots of images like this in street photography. And there's nothing wrong with them as such, but there's nothing interesting. And it's our job as street photographers to make the world look interesting. We often see this image of somebody walking through a, a, a beam of light, but does it really work? It needs another element, another element to elevate it from the mon mundane to the interesting. It could be something really small that, that provides the interest, like this guy's ear flaps, which got caught by the wind. Or the shadow on this woman's face caused by her glasses. 
or maybe it's just a, a, a scene that you think is a pleasing composition, such as this one. Or this one, which is, uh, has a touch of soul lighter about it, but a more abstract quality. But what I try to look out for, though, is uh, a, a real sense of the unusual in the usual, something mundane which becomes interesting, because something just shouts at you to take a second look. Or pictures which beg you to make sense of what's going on, like this one. What is this guy doing? What's, what's it all about? Or this one. Just strange. Or this one. Is the guy disobeying the sign? What's happening here? Who knows? Who, who, who wants to know? Who cares? But it makes you, it does make you think. So tip number six is uh, only use one lens for street photography, at least initially. If you're st start starting out on this journey, I would strongly recommend that you only ever use one lens. And get to know that lens so that you instinctively know what it's seeing so that you understand how it describes the world. My ideal lens is 35mm in, in full frame terms. So in Fujifilm terms or crop sensor terms, something like this 23mm. Uh, this is just about perfect. I particularly like this 1.4 version because I do quite a bit of my street photography at night and I love shooting wide open at night. So uh, this, is, this is my kind of good all round lens. If I'm using my X100, it comes with a fixed 23mm lens, so 35 equivalent, which uh, does an equally terrific job. If you're a micro four third shooter, you should be th thinking along the lines of a 17mm lens. So why wide angle, you're, you're maybe thinking? Well, 35mm in full frame terms is not too far from what the human eye sees. It's roughly a 70 degree angle of view. So people who are looking at your pictures taken with this lens, they're looking at reality. They're looking at what you saw. And this will lead to a, a greater sense of engagement. People will identify more readily with those pictures. They're looking at real life. The other good thing about a wide, ang a wide angle is that it will get your it will get you physically closer to your subject. And we often hear there's uh, one of the kind of rules of street photography is get in close. And it's maybe a little bit overplayed if you ask me, but we do, we should try to aim to get as close as we can uh, comfortably. And this, but by getting physically close, you will, your pictures will have a greater sense of emotion and intimacy it puts you right there in the thick of it, in the action. And the, the, the voyeur shooting from across the road on a 200 or a 300 will be so removed from the, action, from the action. These pictures just won't look realistic. They won't look like street life. So this is my preferred lens, the, the, the 23mm. Uh, my other preferred lens that I do use for street photography, particularly more so at night, is the, the 56mm. And I've got to say, I think this is probably the most beautiful bit of glass I've ever owned. This is the 56mm f1.2. And at night, it is just terrific. You, it lets a lot of light into the camera at f1.2. So it gives you, uh, it's very good in exposure terms. Uh, but it's the ideal focal length, I think, for isolating detail at night. Uh, but it's also the lens I use during the day for street portraits. And street portraits are, uh, I, I guess some purists would say, well, that's not street photography, it's a portrait. But street portraits have always been in a part of street photography, okay, albeit in the margins, but they are part of street photography. And I enjoy shooting street portraits, particularly as part of a project. So, well, talking of projects, my, my tip number seven is use projects to bring a, a real sense of focus and a sense of purpose to your work. People who are new to street photography often struggle to find interesting subject matter. And it's all, it's all too easy to resort to the sort of random, randomness we've been uh, talking about earlier. 
you know, the, the, the thousands of images you will see on the web or Instagram of random people in random places, that random guy walking down the street, people doing nothing in particular. It's all a bit meaningless. There's no sense of narrative, there's no theme, there's no connection between the images. So by working in projects, you can add some real impact to your work. Uh, it, will give you, it will give you a real sense of purpose and fulfillment because there will be an end product. So a project is simply a collection of images which is generated on, around a specific theme with a kind of glue that bonds them all together as a body of work. I'm at any point in my street photography life, I'm working on six, seven, eight projects. So when I go out there shooting for the, I go out shooting tomorrow, I'm really focused on my projects. I know what it is I'm looking for. The material is here on my head. I've just got to find it. It stuffed, I compartmentalize the streets. I put the stuff into these little project boxes. Now, that's not to say that I don't also concentrate on what's going on around me. And I see this great moment happening over here or this great bit of light over here or whatever it is I, I want to shoot. I'm still looking to shoot that, but that's the bonus. These things that happen, these spontaneous reaction things, I still shoot them, but it's the bonus. That's what makes you ultra satisfied at the end of the day. But projects are, are my focus. And projects also give you, they provide you with a clear end game, uh, which could be in the form of a photo book, a set of prints, a set of frame prints on your wall, a set of postcards, an exhibition, a web gallery, even a blog post. But it's something that will spur you on and motivate you to produce a tangible body of work. One, one of the most satisfying outcomes of a project is to share your work and there's a, a real sense of achievement to see your images in a gallery or on a website or in the pages of a book. Zines are currently uh, a very popular way to bring a project to life. So to give you another example of a project that I'm currently working on, it's all about Soho and in particular where the old Soho meets the new Soho. This is an example of uh, a good example of a medium term project. This is now in its fourth year and I think I'll probably have it finished within the next six months, maybe a year, and I'll have a material for a book. But let's have a, a look at a, a couple of these images. So do think about projects, get yourself stuck into a project. It will give you this sense of motivation, fulfillment and purpose. I really strongly recommend it. So my tip number eight is set it and forget it. Street photography shouldn't be complicated. And in fact, from a, a technical perspective, things couldn't be simpler. And what is important is that you're in a state of constant readiness to be able to quickly uh, respond to the scenes evolving around you. So I tend to set up my camera at the start of the day and I don't touch those settings unless the light changes significantly. I really don't want to be faffing around with camera settings and ISO and shutter speeds and stuff, which is wasting all this mental energy, which should really be going into what's going on around me. So here's an approach that works for me. Okay, I start off by setting the ISO to auto. And in the auto ISO settings, I set a minimum shutter speed to 200th of a second. And I set the ISO range to somewhere between say 400 and 3200. That gives me a, a good range for daytime shooting. I'm quite happy for it to go high towards 3200. 
I then put the exposure mode into aperture priority or A mode, and I se select the aperture that I want to work at as at f8. And f8 is a good compromise aperture. It lets a fair amount of light into the camera, and it gives me decent depth of field, decent front to back sharpness. So the auto ISO option, provided you set your menu to give you this minimum shutter speed of a 200th or faster. This will help minimize uh, subject bl blur or camera shake, either of which will ruin your shot. But this little tiny bit of extra noise by potentially having a high ISO won't ruin your shot. So with potentially a high ISO, the camera will choose in aperture priority, a fairly fast shutter speed, something above a 200th of a second. And that's what I need for street photography. So these settings are a good uh, sort of walk around compromise. I call it my walk around setting and it makes sure I get the shot 98% of the time. Any fine tuning to exposure can be done by tweaking the exposure compensation dial up here. And I do this a lot, particularly in good light, uh, typically to maybe uh, protect the highlights or to intense sh intensify shadow areas. And if I have a shadow area, I, I want the shadow to be dark and deep and inky and dramatic, not a wishy-washy shadow. So minus one or minus two on the exposure compensation will really give me some depth. And then if the light is behind me, so I've got bright sunshine streaming from behind me onto my subjects, I'll typically set the uh, exposure compensation to minus one by default. This is by default. And this, this gives a, a, a lovely vibrancy to the colors, keeps the highlights in check, and it just adds a bit of a wow factor to the image. The great thing about uh, these Fujifilm cameras is that you can see all the exposure settings, the exposure triangle. It's all here on the top plate. There's no need to delve into menus and you can make changes quickly on the fly. Having said that, if you, if you have time and you, let's say you find a nice background and you've time to wait, then yes, you choose, you change the settings to suit the situation. So you may want an out of focus background. Sure, open up the aperture, but just remember to reset it to your walk around settings when you set off again. Other settings, well, I try to keep everything, again, really simple. I set white balance to auto. Dynamic range is always 100, and I use matrix metering. I know some street photographers use spot metering. I'm not a big believer in it. I think it takes too long, and there's too much faffing around to make sure your spot is in the right place, and it's taking your focus and attention away from what really matters, which is the moment. And in terms of file format, I usually shoot RAW, although I occasionally use some of the, the Fujifilm film simulations, such as Acros, which is, gives you this beautifully uh, contrasty, gritty, black and white look, or classic negative, if I'm using color, which I think are gorgeous, but I'll sometimes use the JPEGs, but more often than not, I will just work on the, the RAW files. You, uh, you may ask about focusing. And I, although the, the, the autofocus on these cameras is razor sharp, ultra quick and utterly fantastic, but I tend to, I manually focus using zone focusing. And we really haven't got enough time to go into that here, but it's basically using manual focus. And the principle is that at a small aperture, say F8 or F11, if you set your lens to manual, and pre-focus on a certain distance in front of you, you will have a range to work in, a zone. So I know with this camera, with my X100, for example, if I set this to F8 and manual focus, so I set the focusing to manual on the side here, and I manually set the focus point to uh, a point, say, eight or nine feet away, I know that everything between about five feet and about 20 feet will be sharp. And that's my zone. As long as my subject falls into that range, it will be sharp. What more do I need? The danger with autofocus is that 
we tend to obsess about where that little green square is. And I think most of us use this principle of focus and recompose. So you get your camera to your eye, you, you lock onto your subject, and then you recompose to get the composition right. Well, this all takes too long. And while you're doing that, you're missing the moment. You, street photography, you need to be able to react really quickly, as I said before. And zone focusing will help you do that. It's liberating. There are loads of videos on YouTube about how to do zone focusing. And if you put your camera type in, so say Fujifilm X100F zone focusing in the search box in YouTube, you will find loads of uh, very good instructional videos. So tip number nine is to get over your fears of street photography. Most of us have some level of discomfort with photographing people in the street and we all deal with it in different ways. Some people fight the feeling and shoot away regardless. Some will just give up and shoot something different. Others will learn a new set of skills which will help them deal with the difficulties. But here are some ways that can help you minimize your fears. And do invest time working on this. Believe me, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll feel. Street photography is a high mileage pursuit. You put the miles in, everything starts to get better and make sense. So to help overcome any fears that you might have, firstly, make street photography a habit. The more you're out there doing it, the better you'll feel about it. Practice leads to a sense of comfort and ease. Okay, get out there and do it. Secondly, work quickly. Take your shot and move on. Work quietly. If your camera has bleeps, clicks, pings, blinking lights that can be turned off, turn them all off. Be stealthy, be discreet. Thirdly, and I think this is my killer tip, avoid eye contact. You'll find this whole thing much easier if you don't make eye contact with people on the streets. You won't find me making eye contact with my subjects unless I need it for the shot which I may do in 3% of the, the pictures I take. So this refers to before, during and after your shot. Do not make eye contact. If you don't, you will find this whole thing much, much more comfortable and easier. Fourthly, always have confidence in the belief that you're not doing anything wrong, legally, morally or ethically. And keep telling yourself this. You'll certainly be more confident if you know the law and street photography in a public place is perfectly legal in the UK. You don't need anyone's permission to take their picture. Now, if you're traveling, uh, always check where the, the rules and customs where you're traveling to, because in some places it is uh, illegal. So, or, or, or not, uh, or is frowned upon. And for example, in Portugal, I shoot in Lisbon quite a lot. Lisbon is great for street photography, by the way. Uh, I shoot in Lisbon a lot. And if you are shooting in Portugal and somebody says, no, don't take my picture, and you then take it, you're committing a criminal offence and you can be locked up. But in the UK, you do not need, if you're standing in a public place, you don't need permission to take pictures of people, buildings, things, police officers, anything. The rule is, if you can see it, you can shoot it. Just remember that. If you can see it, you can shoot it. But you've got to work on these fears. You know, it's, uh, as I said, practice. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll feel. So my final tip today is forget perfection. Chasing perfection will hold you back as a street photographer because you'll be concentrating on the wrong thing and I guess this, this is why street photography often doesn't do well in camera club competitions. Many judges just can't cope with things not being perfect. Street photographers should be more interested in content and getting the shot, the moment, rather than perfection. It's getting the shot that matters. Here's a great quote from the great Gary Winogrand that sums it all up. The world isn't tidy, it's a mess. I don't try to make it neat. We're photographing what is out there. 
Well, that just about wraps it up. I hope you found this useful. And if you'd like to know more about me or about Fujifilm, do check out these links. I have a YouTube channel, which is 100% Street. Uh, just look at youtube.com slash streetsnappers. And I've got loads of videos uh, packed with tips, inspiration, ideas. Uh, it'd be great to see you on there. And if you fancy a workshop, you can find me at streetsnappers.com. I think that's just about it. Uh, I, I really wish you well in, on your street photography journey. It is fun. It's absorbing. It's interesting. You'll have a blast. So best of luck and thanks for watching. Bye.